So thank you again to La Casa Encendida for organizing these conversations in a very much needed um, moment of collective thoughts and reflection, not only because of the current crisis uh, provoked by the pandemics, but also um, in a moment of social upheaval, somehow provoked by the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, which is forcing to revise the official histories by questioning the existence of certain monuments and symbols and narrate the histories from certain perspectives, both in the USA, in the USA and the UK and other countries in Europe. Uh, now it is time uh, to make a reread of the histories and the salary responsibilities of the wealth of the countries of the old continent. Art has had a critical discourse throughout the years, but it was maybe in the 70s with the emergence of feminism and other social struggles that got more prominently political through a variety of new forms and disciplines that also affected or reflected upon the art institutions through institutional critique. Ever since the art organizations as an entity has served several purposes one of them being a space for critical debate. Together with the aesthetic experience, art organizations have provoked to be a place where critical thought can be nurtured through different typologies of programs, from seminars to reading groups or alliances with university to expand somehow the network of knowledge. The models are diverse and the problematics as well, but the engagement with social and political issues has become part of the contribution to the critical speech in the public sphere. Although far from being free of guilt due to the privileged position as power structures, some organizations have activated mechanisms to unlearn and decolonize the institution. And today we will have the opportunity to discuss about that. The intention today is to open up a conversation around the idea of the art institution as a place to learn with the ability or rather the responsibility to generate the conditions and the tools for critical thinking precisely to help us be alert and understand that which is happening around us. To do so, uh, I have, we have two guests today that will be conversing with us, um, Antonia and Carolina. Antonia Lampi is a curator, researcher and writer born to Southern Italy and currently based in Berlin, where she is artistic co-director of Savi Contemporary, a space where epistemological disobedience and the linking, uh, which are terms coined from Walter Mignola are practiced and the space functions as a place for the colonial practices and aesthetics. Since 2020, she's also in the graduate team of the Quadrennial Sonsbeck, working on the next two editions to be held in 2021 and 2024 to, under the direction of uh, Bonaventure Dinkung. She has also been the initiator and co-founder of several projects such as Toxic Commons, Future Climates or Beirut in Cairo and the curator of Extra City Council in Amberg in 2017 to 2019. In regards to Carolina Ritter, she's a professor at, of creative practice research in the Research Center for Arts, Memory and Communities at Coventry University in UK. She's a research and curator whose work explores the curatorial as an investigative practice, expanding practice-based research in the fields of curating visual arts, visual cultures, and cultural studies. From 2017 to 2019, she was head of public programs and research at Nottingham Nottingham Contemporary in the UK. And she's been the editor of several um, publications and she's in the board of several um, universities here in the UK and in Portugal. Before we jump into the conversation, I would like to invite both Antonia and Carolina to contribute to the idea of the institution yet to come, to then share thoughts, questions and strategies that make of the institution a space for critical thoughts. As we have been announcing this week, the idea of the institution yet to come is a concept borrowed 
from Jose Esteban Muñoz, the Cuban American academic. Um, his concept of queerness, of that that has still not arrived, that it's um, not the here and now, but the then and there. So it gives us the frame to imagine the institution yet to come, the institution we would like to have in the future. So Antonia, um, if you want to begin by your contribution to that institution yet to come, thank you. Um, thank you, Anne, uh, Lucia, and La Casa Encendida for this invitation, first of all. Um, I'm always glad to speak of criticality, but especially critically about institutions. Um, I must say, one of the first things I felt like um, saying or quoting was James Baldwin um, when he says, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. And um, this is actually a quote that is in a text by um, a writer called Kaisha Johnson. And the text was just published a few days ago on Medium, looking into how much, let's say, art organizations all over the world, you know, have kind of like jumped on the train of support of Black Lives Matter. But, you know, thinking about, OK, how much do institutions actually mean their support? And, you know, what does it mean to share um, you know, post on Instagram and, you know, make small campaigns or write small texts when there is actually no readiness, it seems, to actually change itself for real and think about one own organization critically. Um, and this is for me, maybe the, the first thing I wanted to address, because I think this is coming out of a certain, also from frustration and discontent uh, throughout the year, uh, the years actually, um, in, in thinking about how much institution or art organizations tend to perform a certain critical approach, you know, perform um, through very often extremely short uh, temporary programs, certain, um, let's say even anti-racist attitudes, uh, intersectional theories, you know, feminist approaches, but how little of that actually in a way um, transforms or is actually enacted within the institution itself. Um, so if I was were to think about critically about what it means to be an institution of the future, first of all, we need to think about who makes the institution, who is speaking for whom, you know, that so-called diversity that is sort of preached and that idea of, you know, different sort of epistemologies or knowledges that we're supposed to be presenting by finally admitting how, much, how many histories have been malevolently, and I want to pause on malevolently because it's not about forgetting, it's about selecting erasing parts of our history to encourage others, you know, in order to, to sort of look back at a past that needs to be um, sort of looked at in, 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 in broader terms, um, you know, through lenses that stop again, erasing parts of it, then we need to rethink the way, the premises on which we're founded. And, and those premises, uh, you know, encompass every aspect of the institution. Um, and that includes its, its staff. You know, we need to rethink who do we hire, you know, who has power positions, under which conditions, what type of contracts are actually proposed. You know, I am the co-director of a very vulnerable institution uh, called Savvy Contemporary in Berlin, um, who was founded by... Um, Bonaventure Indicum, um, who very often, you know, is asked also for him and many more of my colleagues, um, including myself, for, for, for advice, for support on certain types of artists. And, you know, like the, the truth is that very often <laughs> big institutions wanting to do diverse, you know, non-Western centric programs, you know, ask for support for almost no fees, like to actually, you know, uh, give quick, uh, quick advices or, or list of artists to suddenly show for one exhibition cycle. And then that's it, next to the next topic, you know, and, and, and we move on. Um, very often, uh, you know, people coming with a specific situated knowledges are hired on ridiculous contracts, which means also that the positions uh, in which they're put do not really allow for any actual real criticality because their the contractual power is extremely vulnerable. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you see how, you know, directors and main positions are just the classic sort of, um, you know, um, 
I don't want to be too confrontational, but um, why people talking for the rest of the world? And I feel this is extremely important to acknowledge and change and be ready for that change, which means also asking ourselves, you know, as part of institutions, you know, who are we? Uh, who are we talking for? And um, uh, under which conditions? And um, understanding also that rethinking this, as Lucia also was saying just before in our informal conversation, is an enrichment. It's not a loss of privilege, it's an enrichment to look finally at a much richer range of, of story that will allow us to understand the present uh, more deeply, but also to change the present perhaps for real. Um, so, 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 so that is, for me, um, one extremely important, um, important aspect. Um, because otherwise, it really becomes some sort of an exploitation of certain types of knowledges, which is on, on top of it dressed as some sort of good intention and, and good opportunity to, 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 to do a quote again. You know, the road to hell is, uh, is paved by good intentions. It's not enough. It's not enough. And I think that uh, right now it is a moment in which structures need to be rethought, infrastructures need to be rethought, conditions need to be rethought, redistribution of wealth needs to be taken for real. Um, uh, this seems to be the time. I don't think this is new. I think minorities, let's say, have been chanting for this. Uh, minorities as not enough people, but it is becoming a, a sort of mainstream call for, for, for change, um, which hopefully we can ride on. And I think as cultural organizations that very often take even a relatively, I don't want to say arrogant, but maybe I actually do, um, stands as in, you know, we are able to sort of understand society in a certain way, to produce contents in a certain way, well, then we need to be humble enough to understand how much we didn't do. Um, you know, and how much we are actually very often extremely behind in terms of change. I don't even want to go into the question around labor condition, you know, opportunities for women, for parents, etc. So I feel on the contrary, I'm extremely critical uh, for the way in which art organizations function and the gap between what is said on stage and the ways in which actually the offstage, backstage uh, really functions. And that goes then into payings and rights and fees. And it's, I mean, yeah, can go in many directions but I guess I just start with this one. Great, thank you, Antonia. A lot of things um, I think, I mean, we, we share in principle. And uh, after Carolina gives her insight, we will get into the conversation. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for the, for the invitation. And if you also want to keep an eye on the uh, watch that would be great in case I um, I uh, run over my time but also to Cousin Sindida for setting up the stage for us to have these conversations I'm sure um, not only myself but also the other colleagues you invited on for this conversation when received your invitation thought this is incredibly timely and it's very good that we have the opportunity to have this conversation, and I'm sure we are all all asking ourselves uh, what's going to come, what's the the new normal uh, when we wake uh, up to the post COVID nineteen um, uh, period. So. Um, so as uh, responding to the challenge um, that you put forward, so for us to come up with a, with a, a statement, I believe, or a proposition, um, I did propose uh, institutions must be trusted. And I wanted to uh, explain where this, this claim is coming from, basically. And hopefully it will speak to Antonia's uh, just previous um, uh, concerns, I guess, although I'm going to uh, zoom out a bit, um, and it's not a metaphor related to the platform we are using, it's just literally, uh, so not looking just yet at the infrastructures uh, that Antonio was putting uh, on, on the table, but just to look at probably the macro uh, uh, set of conditions, aka how our institutions are necessarily neoliberal institutions. And I wanted to look at the mechanisms that are already at play within these institutions to think about what, the, what are the possibilities, the realm of possibilities and potentials that are left eventually there. Mm. Sorry, so just... Um, 
just before we set ourselves in that um, in that uh, that sounds kind of a promising future when we hear the institution yet to come. Um, and, and very much drawing on Munoz's proposition, I, I wanted to just wait a second and linger a bit longer in our immediate future. Um, and I want to do that by drawing on especially the situation in the UK. And this is what I've been practicing for the last nearly 10 years. So I have no intention of either generalizing or universalizing anything that I'm going to say here. Uh, it's very much kind of an analysis and, and uh, a, a proposal that comes from my immediate context. So, so if we think of the... Um, the model, let's say, that most of the cultural institutions that still have their, op their doors open um, have currently in the UK. It's a model that very much were uh, started to be defined back uh, 40 years ago with Thatcherism. So very much kind of a very sod solid and very steadily um, implementation of uh, neoliberalism, aka privatization of everything that was back then eventually public. Um, and with that, and I'm going to be talking about something that might sound very peripheral to what is more like this, this critical programming that we want to tackle further, I think, in our conversation, um, but in also the curatorial propositions. But one of the things I want to talk about is the funding structures. Um, and here I want to think very kind of, you know, directly how things work. Um, you know, neoliberal um, paradigm does say um, public intervention should be less and less strong, like a disliked touch state, as they call it, uh, meaning that there were tremendous and still today tremendous cuts to public funding going towards public institutions or cultural institutions. And with that comes another uh, premise, which is that uh, cultural institutions, in order to keep their doors open, and again, this is not for cultural institutions to expand, it's just to continue doing what they were doing before, they have to diversify their portfolio. They have to diversify their income streams. Okay, what in practice it means, means that we have new colleagues in cultural institutions, the development team. And as I said before, um, this team is not about expanding, it's not about opening up space for more colleagues to join the institution. So someone needs to leave in order to find space for this new team to come in. And this team is absolutely crucial because it will be looking for sponsorship, it will be looking to expanding the membership of the institution to again, kind of creating more income streams, meaning like probably private hire, uh, opening a cafe if there's not, not a cafe yet before uh, in a fashionable and expensive one. So we do see like things being reshuffled within the institution. And I want to think of this and also as Antonia mentioned, in terms of infrastructure. So think of the office of a cultural institution. If you have new people coming in, you literally need to make, make more space. But because the idea is not to expand, you actually need to replace people. And what we see is a decreasing in size of curatorial teams. Let's say people that actually you know, were trained and are eventually equipped to program and work in cultural institutions from curatorial teams to, if you are thinking of a museum, conservation teams, et cetera, et cetera. So what we see is the development teams kind of expanding and taking over. But we also see the infrastructure, AKA the physical space of institutions, be it the galleries, be it like the performance space, the cafe, the lobbies, the meeting rooms being also repurposed. So now they are also being offered for private hire where before they were eventually open to a new program to come to, you know, the potential, let's say, of critical programming. But we'll get to that promise as well, I think, in our conversation. Um, and finally, what we see is colleagues like, like us, and I'm sure this speaks to, to all of us, um, at least in kind of around this table, the time we spend uh, filling in application forms. 
and how much of what we do needs to be defined and think of the temporality of an application form needs to be defined now to be delivered in the future. So I wanted really to bring this aspect of time to the conversation, again, back, having in the back of our minds this idea of the institution yet to come, because our immediate future, in fact, will be busy with delivering what we have promised to deliver in the near past meaning like projects that we are going to be delivering two years time, three years time, depending on the kind of the, the temporality of the, of the application uh, grants, um, those projects were defined probably today or a year ago. So there's some sort of, uh, there's an element in this temporality that I think is important for us to reflect on, which is the ways in which these funding streams and very much like these, these funding bodies external to not only the cultural institutions, but to the sector altogether, are defining the priorities and are defining what we can program and cannot program, but also, I think, capturing some potential of being more flexible to address immediate issues, such as COVID-19, such as the current protests going on, and eventually these discussions around, as, as Antonio was uh, uh, putting on the table, uh, around decolonial thought and programming and also diversity. So there's something here about capturing or keeping our future captive of these uh, neoliberal mechanisms through this funding structure. I think, uh, and because uh, time must be um, coming uh, to an end, I, I think what the reason why I, I think uh, my proposition would be based on uh, uh, institutions must be trusted uh, is because I think what's going on currently with this neoliberal model is really um, a, a huge lack of trust in the sector. Um, and I wanted to to keep that there, um, you know, again, to give like this, this kind of macro uh, approach and looking specifically at funding, which I think it's an important thing for us to think as part of the bigger picture and, um, and leave it here, um, leave this proposition around trust and, um, and move on with the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolina. Um, very two different approaches, um, both touching um, themes upon diversity, but I think that um, from very different approaches that I think somehow um, reflects your backgrounds as well. Um, and here I would like to formulate uh, the first question. What's the difference and how from these two perspectives, which, which are very different, a department within an institution with all the capital letters um, from a project, an organization that has as a project somehow to revise the institution as well in many senses. How do you program, how do you generate this criticality? Um, and not within the institution, but also um, towards the audiences and towards embedding that criticality or, or somehow uh, making possible the conditions for that uh, critical thought. Uh, you want to okay. first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I mean, I wanted to also respond on the idea of trust, which I think is actually quite important. Um, also, like, um, and it doesn't, I mean, I, I guess that what I was talking about in a way, even though the way you would talk about trust has to do very much with like funding structures, which I completely agree are extremely important because they do determine what you do, how you can do it, what you say, and again, under whose conditions and terms you can actually say what you're supposed to be saying. So massively shaping and allowing or not allowing. And again, a vulnerable institution like, you know, Sally Contemporary precisely, you know, is completely, um, you know, uh, in a sense, sort of dependent on, 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 on those flows of funding. Um, as everyone else, I, I, I presume, but um, it is about, uh, you know, allowing existence or not, right? Um, and, you know, just to focus again on, on, on the quote I started with, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. This is about trust. 
I cannot trust what you're saying because I see that what you're doing is different than what you're saying. And so again, we go to the core of the issue. Um, and um, to respond to you, Anne, in that sense, I feel that we have to be talking about sustained engagement. Um, you know, um, it, it's, it's not just about exhausting whatever, you know, critical perspective via, via one program or, 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 or one talk, right? Um, it is really about how much we embrace certain positions that are political, that are ideological, that are social, that are intimate and personal as well. How much do we stand our grounds, you know, and how strong and courageous are we to stand certain grounds without continually sort of changing position depending on one compromise or the other that can come from many perspectives, you know. There's always questions around power structures. I mean, this is inevitable, right? Like we live in a context of power structures and those power structures are, you know, funding uh, plays a gigantic role in that. Um, and, 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 and I do feel that in that sense, you know, it is really a question how much do we stand our ground and how much, you know, are we, you know, what, what is worth compromising for? You know, what, what is worth the game, so to speak? Um, and, you know, where do we draw a line um, in that? Um, is, 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 is extremely central. Um, to, to go back to Savi Contemporary, you know, um, I, I don't want to go too much into the detail because I feel that also generally the institutional structure that we have per se and the vulnerable position in which we find ourselves also comes in, let's say, handy in the sense that it does allow for a certain openness that I think stable funding structures perhaps would not allow for. Um, and hence, in a way, we are constantly changing ourselves also in in relationship in a way to the teams that we work with, like new people bring new ideas. I mean, this, this is a fact. Institutions are not just buildings uh, or exhibition spaces. They're very much, you know, uh, shaping themselves uh, in relationship to, to the people they involve. First of all, their own, you know, stable team. And then every single artist and contributor we work with, right? And like, and those conversations allow ours, and, and of course the public and the audience, but, th but that allows ourselves to be, Porous. And I've been reflecting a lot about the notion of porosity. How much do we allow that transformation to take place? And how can we create frameworks that actually allow for that sort of transformability um, to exist uh, within the way in which we work? Which also means giving more time to ourselves in a way, you know? And I, again, to go back to the problem of funding, I mean, there's so much proclamation that needs to be done in funding applications. And then you proclaim... And then you kind of have to like run after making that happen, which very often, you know, does not perhaps have enough time to, to be experimented with, right? Like at that point, then you have a deadline and it needs to happen. And whether you're ready or not is, is, uh, is, is, is not under discussion. You just have to go public. And so I've been reflecting a lot about also how can we become maybe less public as in how can we sort of reverse this logic of proclaiming first and then experimenting but actually experimenting and making it public once you know that experimentation has gone somewhere uh for interesting for real um because otherwise very often it feels like you know uh, kind of like on the shoulders saying we're doing this but you know, to do it for real takes a little longer. And again, this is why also, for example, in our frameworks, they're very long. Like we rarely do, you know, a, a program that is just an exhibition and a talk. Like I feel things are extremely long. They manifest through different programs that continue to change. One exhibition relates to the next. You know, there is never just um, a sort of a compartmentalization of things, but things kind of feed on each other. And we may return to things back as well. You know, we pick up on it again. And we are extremely self-critical, to be honest, um, also within the team. And um, that creates a lot of emotional labor also, right? Because it, it, makes, it makes us insecure, <laughs> you know, to hear critique. But that is an exercise that needs to be, that needs to be constantly performed. Um, yeah. I don't Definitely. Want to um, I wanted to. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. No. Yes. A couple of things on what um, Antonia was saying uh, in terms of porosity. When you think about porosity, um, are you talking about the team, or are you talking really to open up the institution towards? Uh, we will get there probably in uh, further in the conversation. But how you how you affect the context your institution is situated in, 
because I think that's very important and that's one of the things I want to explore later on, uh, how we relate from these critical institutions with our context. And um, another thing I wanted to, to go back to is like maybe uh, to reformulate my question as well, how your different natures as institutions are conditioned uh, when delivering a program, a more or less critical program, which has to do as well, something that both of you were mentioning, which is with time and time. Uh, if you want to, to really have a research-based institution or if you want to affect differently, probably as Antonio was saying, there's a big part that it's not gonna be public, but it's working indoors. So how we balance as well those times of uh, really important work with an impact or a visible impact, right? Um, so I leave it there as something to continue with. And uh, if you can take it from there to Carolina. Sure, yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, thank you, Antonia, for relating to um, funding and, and, you know, just also speaking to the fact that it's not about only the practicalities, but he's very much understanding and acknowledging that those practicalities really keep us captive of experimenting. And as you were saying, uh, one of the, the, the other elements of this, for me, this funding application thing uh, is very much that they need to be drawn on past experimented and legitimate formats. So basically what we are setting forward is something that has already been done. And I think this is really how neoliberalism and keeps us repeating the same. I do also want to speak to the question around criticality, and definitely this is something that, um, you know, in the context of non contemporary, I, I would like to, to, to speak to. Um, and one of the first thing I would say is like the very challenge that you don't deliver criticality. So, so this thing that is like very processual that you need to go into a process, you need to yourself, because again, this is not a, a, a top-down decision, it's not a top-down process. Criticality would be eventually, if we want to, to kind of describe it, um, I think in a nutshell, uh, could be the very process of practicing by being aware of the mechanisms that govern those practices. And I think this is something that really demands, again, time, as you mentioned now, and and I think it's something that is in both of, of our contributions, and Tony in mine, um, and I would definitely stress it yet again. One of the things that uh, we've done at Not In Contemporary uh, within the, the Department of, of Public Programs and research um, that is set up in a very particular way and just very, very shortly, just to give a bit of context, the program and this department is funded by both universities based in Nottingham. It sits within Nottingham Contemporary, but it has some level of independency, let's say, and it sits in the same, uh, with the same level of, of, of independency and, and uh, um, autonomous to the, the, the Department of Exhibitions and Learning. So when I when I first uh, uh, got this uh, invitation, the very first question was exactly what's the role of this department here? And one of the things that we tried to implement is, was a, a site of inquiry, other than a set of programs and events and things that fill in the program and our agendas and look great on our websites and it's great to have a lot of stuff happening but really what was important for us is not to stop time and I really don't want to sound nostalgic like oh now everything is too quick etc and we need to but really to make sure that we had the enough time to look at a particular preoccupation and urgency. And these preoccupations and urgencies were identified not only within the teams, but also because again, like when a very important element, I guess, is that these institutions, hopefully at least, you know, uh, speaking for not in contemporary, these institutions are quite porous, meaning that we do have to think of what is the inward uh, movement when we think about implementing these changes, but we are definitely part of an ecology. And we do work with people all the time. So it's not about thinking that the curators in the institutions are 
sufficient. So the, the ideas they bring to the table, they are sufficient. They don't express the urgencies in the wider context. And the institution needs to hear, needs to listen, needs to be always in the position of rendering its, its infrastructure, its space, physical space, available for other kinds of inquiries, for other questions and other preoccupations. And my worry here is because these places, these spaces, rooms physically, I mean, square meters, these rooms are now being taken by uh, the private hire uh, business model that institutions are forced to implement and benevolently also taking it on board. So, it's, you know, it's, this is a kind of a, a double-edged sword. So what do I mean by sites of inquiry? It's really to take the time to look at the set of concerns and to be able to activate the questions that come out of, that, of those preoccupations, take the time to, uh, to activate them through our program. And we don't know we... We don't know the audience. This is something that we talk a lot about in the context of UK, and Anne, you might, you might be familiar with this, is that traditional or the way we are told to program is that you first identify your audience and then you think how to attract that audience. Well, I think this is absolutely insane because you don't know exactly what the we that is constituted by the position of the question and the activating of the question through the events will generate. And I'm thinking now of, you know, writings of Munoz because, I mean, this is the context in which we are also, you know, gathering here with the institution yet to come and this idea of queerness and this future, this futurity that he was indicating as well, where things that are not yet defined might take place. And really just by identifying the audience that we think are going to come to our events is incredibly perverse. Um, to say the least, to be honest with you. And we can enter into poli uh, identity politics here and we can look into like, you know, equality forms that, you know, and again, uh, working in the UK, I'm sure you are aware of this. Um, and, um, and I'm not saying this is, uh, you know, like a good or a bad mechanism. I'm just kind of, I think, um, shedding light on how these things have been institutionalized as well. Um, and I think rendering a space of critique uh, less and less welcome um, alongside, along with this, and probably now just to, to really to close, uh, I would like to, um, to finish by just um, um, mentioning Paul Gilroy um, in There's Ain't Black um, in Union Jack. And I think this is, um, this is in his editorial to the re-edition in 2002. Okay, so this is not the actual uh, book that was published in the 80s. Uh, but he is, I mean, a very, very sharp analysis of what was happening, what happened between the 80s and the beginning of this century in the UK, and very much looking at the consequences of Thatcherism. And one of the things he is mentioning is the, the, the wave of, of anti-intellectualism. And again, I don't know if this speaks to the Spanish context and to the uh, German context, uh, but it's definitely something very prominent in in the UK. Um, so there's this sense that culture needs to serve a purpose, and that purpose is, um, um, you know, just to finish, and we can explore a bit, a bit more of that, but I would say just entertainment mm -hmm. for the time being. Thank you, Carolina. Yeah, I think that's an issue that it's um, fortunate, unfortunately, it's quite universal. Um, thinking about culture as spectacle and um, entertainment. Um, and it's quite paradoxical that right now, under the lockdown, everyone has been served by that purpose no? of uh, getting um, to read, listen more to music, watch more films. And that's even probably contributed more to that idea of entertainment rather than um, a way to, to somehow nurture or have another view of society. And I say paradoxically because um, it is very different in each country how the governments have uh, responded to, to the cr economical crisis of the cultural sector or artists. And in Spain, it's been quite shameful in that sense. So it's a little bit of an imbalance of, again, uh, how we value culture and arts and what's the purpose of, that, of, of it. No? 
Um, and that's why I am interested in <clears throat> exploring, going back again to that idea of the institution as a place that puts the conditions as to give us the tools to have probably another view or a more completed view of what's happening around us. I would like to maybe um, grab that idea or explore the idea uh, of how from your experience, what is strategies you follow uh, from the institutions or your projects you've been working, which are very, uh, at times, radical or critical, and other times they, are, they cannot be. But there is an engagement. If we are not thinking about that audience, potential audience, as you were um, explaining, Carolina, of, of let's see who is going to come to then propose something with them. How do you engage with your context and how, how do we open our institutions really to, to what sort of public or what, um, how, what strategies do we use to some, somehow attract and, and make people somehow take ownership uh, uh, of the contents we are working on, delivering, and making them part of that community. And I know it's, it's a completely different discourse to the, to the multiple audiences, and I don't want to get there because we are talking about something else. So I want to, to hear that from you um, because we were thinking about the institution and how it institutes itself, how it, 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 it builds its structure. But now let's think about how we relate to the issues that surround us or not, or how we relate to that context, the neighborhood or, or the issues around us. Um, yeah, thank you for, the, for bringing up these aspects uh, towards which there is actually a lot to be said and to be considered. Um, I'll say just a few things um, for the purpose of time also. Um, and one is about perhaps, you know, in this whole sort of narrative around attracting new audiences, I think there is a question about um, do we, you know, feel a certain engagement with those audiences in the first place? Like, what do I mean with that? Is that, you know, I've been working in Germany, in Belgium, et cetera, and um, actually, with a recent experience, um, I, I was working in a, in a place called Extra City Kunsthal in, in Antwerp, and, you know, there was really this, like, sort of, like, top-down um, imperative um, of uh, diversity. Uh, that's, like, what all institutions are being told they should do. But very often, I feel that the managing directors that you know, to whom this is told, have no idea about what that means. Very often have a very limited knowledge even about, you know, what other cultures except for, say, you know, Western white cultures actually exist around them. And when they talk about these communities, there is a very abstract notion of what these communities are and what type of space could be a space that is actually hospitable for more than yourself, so to speak. So who just looks like you, comes from the same type of class, probably has the same religion, speaks the same language and looks more or less like you, right? And so I feel that on the, in, in, in the first place, we need to rethink the type of environments that we create. Again, who speaks to whom is extremely important, like what knowledge comes from that. And when you think about attraction, you know, is there actually an interest in even knowing what these communities are? So now, when I think about Savi, you know, Savi in a way started as a community center. That, that's what it started as, you know, as a space where a lot of people living in Berlin had simply no space for, you know, whose culture was not even seen or recognized. Um, and, you know, one of the first things I feel that you have when you come at Savi, for example, is really how to decolonize the institution means also like, how do we go beyond this like, you know, extremely clinical white spaces where, you know, you enter and you're supposed to perform even in front of the exhibitions in very specific spaces, you know, where the performativity even of the roles is so inscripted in codes. There are codes that not everybody feels familiar with nor particularly welcoming actually. Um, um, and one of the things we do, for example, because we think really closely about what it means to be hospitable. What is radical hospitality? You know, how do you create hospitality in a space? For instance, something that an artist actually said always, 
there's maybe not a hammer at Savvy, but you definitely always find food. Food, extremely important. You know, we cook. <laughs> and that's very important. And various team members actually cook, you know. Um, I'm not one of the best ones, for sure. Um, but the idea of cooking and even the idea of different smells, you know, not the clinical smell of the institution that, you know, kind of feels just as if you would be going to a hospital, to a lawyer office or to foods, offering foods, um, tickets, entrances, you know, does that cost anything? You know, do we actually require the audience to have to afford a center? Because they're also, also in relationship to funding and, and that I find also very interesting. Very often small institutions are also quite vulnerable, you know, are always expected to present everything for free. Whereas big institutions that usually also get state funding and so on, ask for really high tickets. And there's always this like very interesting paradox in which you're already struggling and on top you're also expected to do everything for free. Anyway, for us doing things for free is extremely important um, and the ways in which we offer and do our offerings that are foods that are drinks and there are you know also other kind of um, performative practices we dance we dance and we sing <laughs> we actually do that and the idea of dancing and being together is actually quite important as well and it's not about you know it's not about throwing parties but it's actually about thinking that there's different ways in which certain knowledges or ideas can be can be kind of transmitted i say two more things one one for example also for us is a very important sort of pattern of our program that we call the invocations which are extremely um, long, actually, and enduring uh, public programs in which, um, and this is something that I think different institutions around the globe are increasingly doing, in which different type of knowledges, you know, find a common space uh, to come together, in which it is, uh, first of all, not just, you know, let's say you have an inquiry and that inquiry, those questions, those spaces are inhabited by very different ways of relating to it. There are performative, poetic, music. Music plays a very important role um, for us. Um, music has been there since pretty much the beginning and the ways in which that forms rhythms, the ways in which that creates different sensual experiences um, is, is, is very central. And in that sense, you know, creating ways in which we understand that it's not just about certain types of you know, languages that, um, and of course, again, language plays an important role. Whose language are we, you know, are we, are we talking? And, um, um, and, and who does that? And, and by language, I don't just mean, uh, you know, whatever, English, German, Italian, etc. but it's also body languages. It's uh, institutional, it's performative languages and so on. Um, something else that I want to add to this idea also of like inclusion and diversity, et cetera, is that um, something that came out actually in a panel um, that uh, was part of an exhibition I was curating um, by the end of last year, in which we had various representatives of different organizations uh, involved in environmental justice movements. And um, we also had a representative of Extinction Rebellion, and then we had representative of another group that really um, uh, strives for more intersectionality within the environmental, uh, you know, justice movements themselves. And when, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're uh, uh, aware, especially you, Carolina, in the UK, about a number of criticism that has been raised, uh, you know, against uh, Extinction Rebellion, precisely because of its overtly uh, whiteness, but also, anyway, I won't go too much into it. But at the question that was posed about um, that, that the representative of Extinction Rebellion was saying about how, you know, tell us, how can we become more diverse, you know, as the Extinction Rebellion kind of represented in a panel, the big institution. The question was like, what about stepping back? You know, maybe it's not about you becoming more diverse, but you taking a step back and supporting all of diverse, all of those diverse groups and movements that already exist. So it's not just about centralizing all that diversity into you, but perhaps in looking a second that that exists already. And perhaps it's about drawing back, reshifting funding and energy towards all of those movements that are there. They're just not acknowledged. They're not funded. They're not given space. But so, and, and I think that this is extremely important, um, especially again, when we look into funding, power structures, et cetera. Maybe it's not just about diversifying. Maybe it's really decreasing <laughs> and shifting and supporting other things that are there already, you know, and they don't need to be attracted. They just need to be more supported. Um, yeah, and I'll, 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 that's I'll very leave it at that. Yeah, um, that's very interesting, uh, Antonia. I completely uh, relate to that. I think um, 
while I would use the term solidarity, I think I think there's a, a tendency to come up with the next new big thing. Um, and I think in terms of the current protests, probably would be good to note as well in relation to um, you know paying attention and acknowledging that this fight is a long fight. Um, this, I mean, you know, anti-racist movements, this is not today, this is not yesterday, you know, we're talking about 500 years of colonialism, of trade slave, um, so, so uh, slave trade, so we are talking about like infrastructures that are very much on the constituency of the very notion of public institution, I mean, you know, like that's exactly uh, what it is, so it would be uh, incredibly important to, um, to also understand, which is something that really, uh, was again um, was again with the, with the logic of institutionalizing um, the ideas around diversity and equality uh, was something that was lost in UK because if you look back at the anti-racist movements taking place in the 50s and in the 70s they were black and Asian they were not black and they were black and Asian. So you would see community centers really bringing all these people together. And you have the emergence of the black arts movement in the, in the early, you know, late seventies, early eighties in this country, precisely out of those solidarities. And this is something that unfortunately, um, you know, arguably disappeared. Okay. Um, okay. So, but just go back to uh your question, and now I, I lost a bit track, but yeah, I think you were talking about strategies, yeah, strategies of, um, well, I, I would say that, you know, just to start with, and going back to the term porosity, institutions are necessarily, they should at least, they should be necessarily porous. And what we are saying here is that they don't, they don't operate in an internal ecology only. They are part of a broader ecology. And we can think of, you know, major societal issues to local, you know, neighborhood wise uh, uh, size um, relationships. So I think what an institution needs to acknowledge is that connectivity first and foremost. So it doesn't exist as a, as a standalone thing. It doesn't have its breeding system isolated from everything else. It's connected as part of, and you need to acknowledge that. And that means, I mean, really, as, as we were talking about before, I guess, that curators that are meant to curate all the time and come up with the fashionable new idea, you know, be it ecology, be it whatever, you name it, actually to open the doors for programming to those that are part of that ecology. And I think this is incredibly important. I mean, and for us as programmers, as curators, we know we run out of ideas. I mean, it's fine. You know, it's okay. Because we also have individually, I think, our own priorities and concerns. So it's okay if we want to delve into those with a kind of a longer period of time, instead of like next three months, we have to come up with something new because there's another exhibition to fill in these massive, you know, exhibition spaces. So I think we need to be less anxious. We need to understand that this is a dialogue. And I think we need to understand hopefully that institutions need to be open to be used by others okay and I think this is the kind of you know trustful relationship I guess that I was speaking to that doesn't compute only in relation to funding bodies and institutions it needs to be necessarily across the ecology so so this is one of the things I guess I would say is um, the success of an institution is not footfall I don't care how many people enter not in contemporary because not in contemporary is not only uh, is not only solely not in contemporary as a as a, 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 a building you know as a, a physical structure it happens elsewhere you know it happens in this conversation as well it happens in other uh, rooms and other spaces across the city and the country so I think we need to understand that institutions are like this more kind of octopus-like uh, beings um, and, and able to hopefully mutate into if we are not too stranded by this, you know, the, 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 the contract agreement of uh, funding applications that then bound us to the future of repeating the same. So, so I think this is, um, this is what I would, I would say, yeah. And just if I can add um, to um to be even more direct is like you want to reach a certain community, hire people from that community to work with you and not hire them only on like some ridiculous pay to give you advice on who to invite and, you know, like, I mean, you know, you want to reach different people, engage with different histories, do it for real, <laughs> do it for real. It can't just be an edited compilation by the same, same um, with, you know, small little token names and then imagine that there is going to be 
a real change in that. And I, I really, I really feel this is um, extreme importance uh, because uh, there is still uh, an extreme inequality and injustice in 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 in, 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 in really the organization art organizational landscape um, of uh, more or less the globe, and that has to do, um, yeah. Class obviously also plays an important role, but anyway, but I, I really mean it. I feel there needs to be um, openness and, uh, and, and, and engagement also from the perspective of the institution that is long-term, meaning we think teams really do. <laughs> this is my, um, I think this really is central in my decalogue for the future, um, uh, yeah. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I completely agree as well. In, in the same terms of that porosity, it does affect the structure as well from outside. And that's why I insisted so much in the context and how we relate to it. And we are not one more institution that can operate in Brooklyn, London, or can operate in Auckland, in Berlin, right? So that's part of what we have to construct, I believe. And to, um, to relate it to what um, Carolina was saying, that uh, we need our tempos and our times and to deaccelerate. It all depends again on the funding bodies and we know that that's the trap here. And it's like, you need to get certain amount of people and you need to get certain amount of uh, activities throughout the year. So it's to learn how to escape that. And I think that's one of the key things. And uh, we only have a few minutes left. So um, I would like to finish up maybe with a speculative question of how do you think this various crisis, and I know we've been in crisis for many years right now, but I think we've, now we've got like two very um, intense crises, collective crisis that we are going through. Uh, how do you think this is going to affect us as institutions and how we have to react to that? Um, with courage and solidarity. Um, with courage and solidarity, which means also really, really taking solidarity um, by its uh, real meaning. Um, and uh, that means, um, you know, uh, thinking about uh, labor structures and, and, and labor conditions of now and the future, um, uh, pushing towards societal changes that go beyond ourselves, um, from universal basic income to universal access to education. And I feel that it's only through maybe global, uh, you know, translocal uh, alliances um, that we can also reach um, more justice. And I feel really this is the moment to think beyond ourselves and our own communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, also I've been very fascinated by... Um, a conversation to uh, there was a, a published interview with um, an academic called Robin Kelly that was really looking about on the difference between empathy and solidarity. He was saying, you know, it's not about you know feeling exactly what the other feels because you will never be able to feel exactly what the other feels if you're not the other. But that means standing along with that position nonetheless and understanding as much as you can while understanding the limits of your understanding and be standing along and fighting for. Um, and I think this is something extremely important right now. Um, and I think we have, as cultural institutions, if we even want to call ourselves as such, a very, very prominent role uh, in, in, in that um, fight. And we are agents of change, not the only ones. We're ones among many others. Um, but I think standing grounds um, and, and, and meaning deeply uh, what we say, which means also being there to protect uh, vulnerable positions um, that are even more vulnerable now, um, is, is what we've got to do. And, you know, um, redistribute privileges in that sense. And, 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 and again, think about the different positions that surround us. That's my two cents. Okay, so... Um... Uh, it's. It's. Uh, I would say that it's a, a rather. It's the most difficult question. I think um, 
uh, I don't have a very optimistic view. I, I do think that ultimately things are going to look slightly even more grimmer and uh, more uh, enclosed. Borders are going to be stiffer. Um, um, inequality is incredibly uh, stressed with, with what we are going through. Um, um, uh, you know, like surveillance, I mean, let alone like all the implementation of, um, you know, surveillance mechanisms that were in, on standby and now overnight were implemented. So, so really we are waking up to a rather uh, intensified, I think, reality of what we had kind of a glimpse at before. Um, so having said that, um, um, I think that uh, I think that what I would like to do is to challenge the very notion of crisis. And I'm not saying we are not going through a crisis, but I wanted to say that this is only a global crisis in inverted commas because it's hitting home. So um, it, this is happening and it's, it's happening in, in Europe and it changes the whole discourse around what the COVID-19 is. In terms of what's happening in the hands of the police in the US and elsewhere and the death of uh, uh, George Lloyd, I would have to say that this is not a crisis. It's been on for ages, as we mentioned before. We're talking about centuries. So it's not a crisis. This is just reality, really, for most of the people. So what I think we need to do is to take this seriously. What I think we need to do is to come down from our, um, you know, privileged position of looking at things happening across the world, including wars waged by Europe and by the West elsewhere as being just side effects of whatever politics and understand that these, these inequality and, and you, know, you know, racism in its structural being is something that was constructed by Europe in the first place. And it's a pan-European project, really. It's not one country here and there. It's a pan-European project. So, um, this is, we have to take this seriously once and for most, but it's not a crisis, it's just the ongoing uh, state of affairs. So, so that's what I would like to add, yeah. Great, yeah, indeed, it's the unveiling of a situation now that has been long going on and, and suddenly it, it looks like the awareness is much bigger right now, no? uh, for those that were not looking or, or including other institutional states as well. So thank you for your powerful insights into mm -hmm. the situation right now, uh, socially and in, 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 in the art institution, which is only a part of our social society. So um, I wanted to thank you again, and I hope uh, that thank we you. affect in at least, which I think it's like an acupuncture as well, um, like affecting our surroundings, we can get to affect the globality of the situations, right? But we need a long time for that. But I think we have to to hold to that um, hope, or, or more than hope, it's it's the will, no, to change things and and be there in the action. So. Thank you very much. We will be looking at what you're doing from, from your different uh, practices and perspectives. And hopefully we will meet again in stronger situations again. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for the invitation. Thank you for the, the, the rest of the conversations as well. Bye. Yeah.